Now, when you see this water, this is the age-old experiment. Uh, do I have a glass that's half full here, or is this, or is this glass half empty? How do you see it? Half full. Half full? You don't have to give what you think should be the answer, okay? Uh, we all view this differently. This is an experiment, a very popular experiment. Now it's definitely less than half full. It's a quarter full. Or a quarter. Half, it's a quarter full. Yeah, that's how you say it. Uh, but it's a popular experiment depending on your personality type. You have the optimist, right? This is a person that looks at the situation and has this set of facts, looks at the circumstances, and the optimist will see the bright th side of things. The optimist will, will think, well, things will eventually improve. It, this will work out for the benefit of everyone. That's the optimist. The glass is half full. Then you have the pessimist. And this pessimist can look at the same set of circumstances, the same set of facts, and see things in a way that they're much more complex than we realize. Uh, things probably are not going to work out. And in fact, they could go worse than anyone realized, especially for ourselves. So when you do this experiment, I think most of us are a mix uh, of both of these, uh, depending on the time in our life or the time of day, certainly. Now think about this. You have the optimist and you have the pessimist. You are a follower of Jesus. What is the mindset that's most consistent with what it means to be a Christian? Think about that. If you're a follower of Jesus, what's the mindset that's most consistent with the thinking of a Christian? Is it the optimist? Is it the pessimist? Well, let's think about that. <laughs> Pessimism is not an option, right? I mean, when you think about, if, if you look at the world, horrible things happen all the time. Yes. Lots of pain and suffering in our own lives. But when you have this pessimism mindset, okay, oh, that doesn't really match with Christianity because Jesus has come. He has uh, come to this earth. He has shared in our suffering. He's absorbed death himself. And not only that, he conquered death through his love and through his grace, through his death, through his resurrection. These are core beliefs if you're a Christian. Amen. So the mindset of pessimism does not match with the mindset of a follower of Jesus. So we can take that one off the table. On the other hand, we may need to eliminate optimism as well. You see, optimism is naive. The scriptures, uh, if you've read them recently, okay, uh, they are not naive. Uh, they, uh, they tell us Time and time again that the human heart is sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. The human heart has darkness in it. It's sinful. Yeah. Now, if you're in this room and you're at least 19 years old, congratulations. You were born in the most violent century of war, perhaps, in the history of the world. Mm. If you were born in the 20th century, that's your legacy. Blood, war, death, evil, from the top to the bottom. And it doesn't seem that things are getting better. You have random, senseless acts of evil. Evil erupts in our world all the time, and the evidence tells us not to be optimistic. So pessimism or optimism? I propose a third option. It's called biblical hope. Amen. That's our theme as a church for the autumn. Hope. Please turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. Last week we defined biblical hope. 
This week we dig deeper into God's hope or his hope that he has, that he passes on to his people that a Messiah is coming. We're going to dig deeper. We're going to dive into the hope God's people have for a Savior. And you'll see it's the surprise of hope. Isaiah chapter 8. We'll get there in a few moments. I do want to credit Tim Mackey. He has this incredible podcast series called Exploring My Strange Bible. And a lot of his thoughts on hope come from one of his podcasts uh, which I found very enlightening and very helpful in putting it together the lesson today. But again, biblical hope, the third option, not optimism, not pessimism, hope. Now I want to read you a quote. This is from a gentleman named Cornell West. Uh, he's been a professor at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, He's a philosopher, political activist. He did an interview with Rolling Stone magazine. And here's his quote about hope. Hope and optimism are different. Optimism tends to be based on the notion that there's enough evidence out there to believe things are going to get better. It's much more rational optimism. It's rational. It's deeply secular. Whereas hope looks at the evidence and says, it doesn't look good at all. Doesn't look good at all. I'm going to go beyond the evidence and create new possibilities based on visions that become contagious to allow people to engage in heroic actions, always against the odds, but there's no guarantee whatsoever. That's hope. I'm a prisoner of hope, though. I'm going to die a prisoner of hope. I think that helps us a bit. Some of the thoughts in there, uh, when we think about optimism, it is rational. It's deeply secular. And you do have some evidence, if you look hard enough, that things will get better. Yeah. But what do you do if the evidence tells you things are not getting better? Mm. Come on. The world around you. Political systems. Your own life. <laughs> things are not getting better. What if the evidence tells you it's not getting better? It's, it's getting worse. The dirty politics, violence, racism, your mental health, your physical health. What does the evidence tell you? What if it's a terrible relationship with family members? What do you do if the evidence tells you it's not really getting better? In fact, I could even make an argument it's getting worse and it's more pain. That's when you turn to Christian hope. Hope keeps your heart, your mind, your soul alert to what God is doing in this world and what God is doing in your own life. So unlike optimism, you can have hope. No matter how the world is going, and no matter how good or bad your circumstances are in your own life, you can have hope. Amen. And that's the hope we all desperately need. That's the hope we're going to explore in our biblical text this morning. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Isaiah writes, bind up the testimony. Seal the teaching among my disciples. Verse 17. I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope in him. Let's skip ahead to verse 20. To the teaching and to the testimony, if they will not speak according to his word, is because they have no dawn. They, the Israelites, will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry. And when they are hungry, they will be enraged and will speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward. I'll stop for a moment. You ever wonder where this word hangry comes from? <laughs> it's right here. You see, it's right here in this text. The Israelites, they're hungry and they're angry. 
They're hangry. If you've ever felt that, you may be feeling that now. I'm sorry if I tempted you into thinking that, and now all of a sudden you're hangry. Uh, we'll get food in just a moment. But hangry is a terrible feeling. Imagine living that way all the time. Verse 22, and the Israelites, they will look to the earth, they will look around the world, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Verse 1, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Now, I'm sure this makes perfect sense to everyone. <laughs> of course not. But we, we see some words here. We'll break some of this down today. Dig deeper on your own as well. To know the history in this, but you see themes, you see words throughout the text. Uh, as I mentioned, angry Israelites, mad at the king, speaking bad of God Almighty. They look at their world, they see gloom and anguish. It literally says God is hiding his face. Where are you, God? No dawn, thick darkness. And then we hear these. These lands that may be unfamiliar to us, Zebulun and Naphtali. We hear about former times, latter times. Let's take a look at this and what's going on during Isaiah's time of this prophecy. It's a very dark time in Israel. Very dark time in the history of Israel when he writes this. This is 250 years after King David and all the glory of Israel and King Solomon after that. But centuries have passed and northern Israel has cheated on God generation after generation. God keeps sending prophets to them, warning them, inspiring them to go back to the deal, the covenant they had with their God. But they abandoned the covenant. Nearly all the kings have been terrible. All of their leaders. And all the things the, pro the people have promised to do, they haven't done. And all the things they said they would not do, they're doing. Everything has gone sideways. It, the land is full of injustice and neglect of the poor. They're trusting in political alliances. They're mixing worship of Yahweh with the worship of other gods and nations. So after many warnings, God gives his people over to the consequences of their sin. And what you see up here, this is the original allotment of land for the 12 tribes of Israel. Now up in the north, you'll see This is Zebulun and Naphtali. It's the Sea of Galilee, also known by that name. And so that's what it looked like when Joshua and the Israelites came in and took the promised land. Everyone had their own state, uh, their tribes, and, and there was rich abundance and a promising future. But nearly 300 years later, darkness. God sends the Assyrians to discipline his people. His people who had chosen divorce from God, had abandoned the covenant. And so you can read about this in 2 Kings 15. That's when it happened. The Assyrian Empire, the biggest empire in the world at that time. And you can see in the purple slash pinkish hue, there, that's their later expansion, and that gives you just an idea of how big the Assyrian Empire would become. But the beginnings of it started in this green color. Now, you know the story of Jonah. If you look back, and Jonah, and he went and he preached in Nineveh. There was a time of repentance for the Assyrians. That didn't last very long. So Nineveh is here. And so the Assyrians grew in power... And as they grew in power and as God's people continued to cheat on him, 
and neglect him and abandon the covenant, the Assyrians came in in a wave. And they came right here. That big map that I showed you before, it's a little one here compared to the Assyrian Empire. Okay, Naphtali and Zebulun are right here. So the big bad Assyrian Empire came in and demolished them. Swept them away. And that's the context of Isaiah 8 and 9 that we're reading today. That's the audience that Isaiah is preaching to and writing to. So, and, and it happened. Just as Isaiah predicted, Assyria came in, they wiped out northern Israel, they invaded uh, these two lands around the Sea of Galilee, and for those they did not kill, the Assyrians who were ruthless, they took all the prisoners back to Assyria with them. They deported them. Can you imagine an entire country invaded and then they, they killed many? And then they take the rest of them. Most of them, in this case, they, they had this practice of putting a hook in their nose and, and chaining the people together. So they came in. This is the Assyrians. And the whole country, both of these countries were demolished. Wiped out. And then from that point on, those tribes, northern Israel, they, they mixed into Assyrian culture. They're gone. It's over. And I, I know it's hard for us to relate to this today. I want you to, to see the geography of it. It's hard to, uh, to us to think that of a world where we're invaded on this island. It's been a long time since that threat. It's hard for us to look at the map and go, okay, I'll give you an idea. There's this crazy television series called The Man in the High Castle. And it's on Amazon Prime. And it's an alternative reality. And it's really happening. It's a reality. What if the Axis powers actually won World War II? What would our world be like today? Germany, Japan, the Nazis, they win. What's the world like? It's very creepy when you watch this show. Now, I'll show you another map. That this, is, this is what the, show, the, show, the map on the show would look like. All right, you see the nationalist state of Britain. Everything that's in that dark red is Nazi including most of America. It's a crazy scenario to see this. Imagine, you know, just wiping people out. I mean, there's talk of, it, they, they've started concentration camps and uh, Holocaust in the United States as well. You know, of course, you always have heroes that are fighting back underground, but... <laughs> This gives you an idea, when, when you read this text, this is what's happening. Assyria has come in and destroyed them. And they're no longer a people. That's dark. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel eventually completely annihilated and gone to this day. So that's the result of centuries of rejecting Yahweh. It's tragic. And in the language of this text, God turns out the lights on Israel. Thrust into darkness, no dawn. And for those that survive, the gloom of anguish, anger, and hunger. So you can see if this happened to us and where the audience originally was in this prophecy is, where is God? When's he going to turn the lights back on? During Isaiah's time, there was absolutely no reason for optimism. None. But somehow, some way, you look at chapter 8, verse 17, Isaiah gives them a vision of hope. In the middle of all that, a vision of hope. He says in verse 17, I'll read it again, I will wait for the Lord. Who is hiding his face from us. I will hope in him. And then in 
Chapter 9, verse 1, he tells us about this hope. What it is, he tells us what he's waiting for. Verse 1, there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he was brought into contempt, in the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So you see, in the former time, Zebulun and Naphtali experienced the consequences of their evil. But in the latter time, this land beyond the Jordan, the land of Galilee, this land will be made glorious by God. One glorious day, God's grace, God's love will have the final word. Human rebellion and sin do not get the last laugh. God's love has the final word. Let's read more of Isaiah's hope, verse 2. So the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of the oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior, and battle to all, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder. And his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord God Almighty will accomplish this. So that's a vision of hope in verse 2. There may be deep darkness now, but Isaiah says, I will wait for the Lord. He will turn the lights back on. And you see some description of that in verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. In verse 3, it's, we're going to restore the nation. There's going to be joy, like, in the greatest of harvest. Just wait. It will happen. It's the joy of when soldiers uh, win a battle. You see, Israel had had no victory. But it's the joy, it's the image of having great victory and dividing the spoils. And there's, then in verse 4, it's this image of the yoke being broken off their backs, taken off their neck. You know, the yoke is an image of slavery where people were treated like the ox, treated like an animal for the benefit of the oppressor. You see, Isaiah saying Israel's burden has been broken. He's speaking as if it already happened. It's been broken. And you remember the time Gideon won that crazy battle against Midian with just some clay pots and these lanterns and lights with about 300 men? That's what it's going to be like. You wouldn't believe it. And then verse 5, all these war clothes, all the blood, all of that's going to be burned when Yahweh turns the lights back on. And then verses 6 and 7 are Christmas verses, right? Look great on the magnet somewhere. Well, it, it talks about the birth of a child. When the lights turn back on, the child's flipping the switch. And we see all these names that this child will be called that symbolize this child's character, this child's destiny. Wonderful counselor. Now that doesn't mean he'll be a good therapist. That's not how it's translated here, although I'm sure he'd be a great one. Uh, it means he's a wise strategist. He has a plan to work his wonderful acts of salvation. He has a plan. He's a mighty God. This child's going to be the embodiment of the almighty God of Israel. He's an everlasting father. He's powerful, but he's also close to you. He's intimate. He's gentle. He's humble. He's going to protect you. 
He's the Prince of Peace. And for the Jew, they hear this word Shalom, which is not only the absence of conflict, but for them, this word, he'd be the Prince of Shalom. That means with this king, there's going to be relational harmony among the nations. Among many different kinds of people, there will be friendship. We have the opportunity for a tight-knit community of safety and abundance. That's the Prince of Peace. He will set all wrong things right. He will restore all things. So there's no reason for optimism in Isaiah's day. But there's hope. And remember, hope has nothing to do with current circumstances, but everything to do with God's promises to send a deliverer. And you know this, it's not a surprise at least who this is. They all meet their fulfillment in Jesus, the ultimate hope. But the Gospel of Matthew connects the dots for us on this. Just mark in your notes Matthew 4, verses 12 through 19. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. To summarize, Jesus returns to this very region that was taken out by Assyria. Think about it. Jesus was raised among those small, forgotten villages near the Sea of Galilee. Galilee became a land of humiliation and darkness, a land of disgrace, even among the Jews. If you lived in Jerusalem, it was shameful to, to live up there. That wasn't a good neighborhood for the Jew. So it was a land of disgrace, and this becomes the staging ground for the bursting of hope and the coming of the kingdom with Jesus. What a magnificent surprise. More on that in a moment. The surprise. Mm -hmm. Now keep this in mind. 700 years separate Isaiah's hopeful pro prophecy and the arrival of Jesus. 700 years. Mm -hmm. And you talk about these battles that you hear about in, in Scotland from years past of Robert the Bruce and William Wallace. So we're, talking, we're talking relatively about that amount of time from the wars of independence in Scotland until now, Isaiah's prophecy to the arrival of Jesus, 700 years, that's a long time. But see, Isaiah holds out this hope of vision. He holds out this hope of vision in the middle of all the gloom. So I think this is very important for us to learn here that the point of prophecy is not to give a timeline. The point of hope is not about timelines. Hope has nothing to do with your timeline. And that's where we falter. Hope has nothing to do with your timeline. What hope does is it points us to God's character. That's what Isaiah is doing here. It's not about when it's going to happen. It is going to happen. But this hope is pointing to God's character. That's the point of Isaiah's prophecy, the point of hope, to let you know about God's character. Mm -hmm. We do not hope in timelines. We can only find hope in God's character and God's promises. Do you want to wait 700 years? I'd be impressed if you were still around waiting for something for 700 years. That'd be amazing in itself. 700 years. This struggle of waiting is legitimate. Hope deferred does make the heart sick. That's the story of God's people. Are we any different? You have this tension of holding on to hope and God's promises. And you wonder why we have psalms in the Bible and lamentations. You, you have these, these poets, these songwriters. And they're lamenting and they're saying to God, how long, God? 
How long do I have to look at injustice? How long do we have to go through the suffering? Where are you? Show your face to me. I want to be near you, God. Where is God? Evil erupts. Where are you, God? So what does this mean for us today? Biblical hope is trusting that God has the freedom of creativity on how he will fulfill his promises. Now remember, it's not about timelines, it's about God's character. And then on top of that, biblical hope is you trust in God's freedom and his creativity on how and when he's going to fulfill his promises. So consider this question. Did God fulfill his promises from Isaiah 9? Did he fulfill those prophecies of Isaiah? Did he fulfill those in a straightforward, predictable way? No. We'd be kidding ourselves if we'd be like, well, I wouldn't have been like the Israelites. I would have never missed it. Right. <laughs> the answer is no. I mean, it was completely unpredictable. It, it was surprising. I mean, they did have Isaiah 53, the, the suffering servant, but they didn't connect it. So you had seven. I, think about this. God, again, he has the freedom. It sounds obvious, but we need to admit this. God has the freedom to fulfill his promises in the most creative, unpredictable way possible. And that's usually what he does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the story of God and his people. Yeah. You think about 700 years of waiting. And then if you get to the end of your Old Testament, there's Malachi and he has his prophecy. And then 400 years of silence until the last prophet, John the Baptist. So Malachi to Matthew, 400 years of silence. So unpredictable, surprising. That's our God. That's hope. So, you know, Jesus finally comes. It's scandalous. He claims to be the Messiah, and the things he's doing do not fit the expectations the people have. Mm -hmm. yeah. His heritage, yes, he's born in Bethlehem in the line of David, but that was hidden unless you looked for it. Yeah. The wisest scholars missed it. Mm -hmm. Now, the wise men, they, they, they caught on to that, but just for generations... His lineage was considered lower class. <laughs> he was born amid scandal, infidelity, accusations, whispers of divorce. We have a king that was born in a barn. He's a no-name guy with average looks, small town with a bad reputation. I mean, think about his friends and the ones he chose to train, the people he was hanging out with most of the time, prostitutes, tax collectors, political zealots, fishermen from Galilee. Think about when Jesus came. Think about who he identified as his enemy. Yeah. From the very beginning, it was very clear his target, his enemy. He had one, but it wasn't Rome. That was not his target. He had a very clear enemy, and it was Satan, the accuser. The one who brings a lot of this suffering and distrust and insecurity, uh, the evil into the world. Uh, Jesus would teach again and again, pray to the Lord that you do not fall into temptation. So the powers of evil, that's... His target. He had this goal that he could renew and restore the human heart and the mind. And he knew he could bring hope this way. Jesus is full of surprises as God fulfills hope. You know, was Jesus ever recognized as king? 
Did he ever take the government on his shoulders as Isaiah prophesied? Yeah. But it was a Roman execution rack. That's how he took the government on his shoulders. He carried the cross. He was dressed like a king. He was given a scepter. He was given a crown. He was lifted up on the cross. What a surprising and unexpected way to fulfill God's promises. And to use the people who the promises were given to, to execute him. This is an upside down way. Uh, it, it's, it's Jesus comes in, he, he wins by giving up his life. Love is shown to be more powerful than death. What a surprising way that Jesus takes the throne of David and then creates a pathway of peace. Again, no one in Jesus' day put it all together. Very few. None of us would have thought of this plan. So biblical hope, it's trusting in God's promises. But not only that, it's understanding that God's freedom and creativity will shine in his promises and he will answer his promises often in a very unpredictable way. Okay, so you trust in God's promises, that's hope, but then you've got to know going in that God has the freedom and creativity to fulfill his promises in unpredictable ways. So, the application to us. Our vision as a church, regenerate. Again, hearkening back to Zechariah chapter 8 and God's vision for his people. The joy among his people, the joy in the church, this multi-generational church where it's growing, where people have these incredible relationships with one another. And God is so evident among them that, that people flock to it and pull up their sleeve and says, I want to go with you because it's obvious God is with you. That's the vision of Zechariah 8. So when you read this passage about us and what God promises we can become, how do you see that happening? How's God going to make us into a Zechariah 8 church? How do you see it happening? This is where we must pray and be men and women of the Spirit and prepare and remember God's creativity. Yeah. I think we look for things in a way we think and expect them to be. Yeah. Or, or it's, it's God fulfilling His promise in a way He did in the past. Mm -hmm. Then we're making the same mistake that's made year after year, generation after generation, century after century in the Bible. We misread and misunderstand the hope in God. So we, we have to be ready when we have this vision of who we are going to become that God's going to fulfill this in creative and unexpected ways. And it may not and probably will not look like something in the past. And if, if, if we don't get this, we're going to be just like our forefathers because when God fulfills his promises, we're going to miss it. And perhaps even get bitter and not want it. Also, think about yourself. Think about what are you personally hoping for in your own life? What are your biggest hopes in your own life? I think it, it, it needs to be exciting for you to think all the things God could do. God has the freedom in your life and the creativity to fulfill his promises in your life in unpredictable ways. Buckle your seatbelts. That's his track record. And I'd also urge you to imitate your father in this. The people in this church who have the most hope, as we looked at in Romans 5 last week, the people with hope in this church are the ones that are mature. 
Perseverance has done its work and matured into hope, Romans 5. But also, those that have hope in this church, like God, they're the most idealistic. They're the most creative. They're looking for God to do things in unpredictable ways and answering the hopes and dreams of this church, the hopes and dreams for yourself, for your family. That's where we can imitate God. Now, we, we have examples here that we can aspire to. And I'm grateful for that. You know, one of the hardest things for us as Christians is to have our worlds collide. The world outside these doors, our extended family, our school, our work, that world of our neighborhood to collide with this world. Right? These people know you go to church every Sunday. <laughs> But it, we're, we're, we're trying to have these worlds collide. And yes, Sunday mornings come on along. But God can do it in so many other ways. We have to open our minds. It can't just be this hour and a half, two hours if the preacher goes long like today. It, it can't just be this. We bank on this. It's just one way. So... What do we do? Where do we go from here? I'll give you some of the same ones. Well, we'll keep going after it. Dive deeper. Go into these scriptures. I emailed them out last week. I'll email these out as well. It's really up to you whether you're going to stay in the shallow end or put in the work to swim deeper. I'll tell you what, if you swim deeper, hope is waiting for you out there. It's where God is. So dive deeper. And as you dive deeper, you've got to get vulnerable. You, you, you know that hope will make your heart sick. It can put you out there. You don't know how someone's going to respond. But you have to make your hopes known. Known to God and known to the people close to you. And then from today, I think you need to anticipate God's promises and imitate how he does the fulfillment of promises. You know, look again at the scriptures. Discover the unpredictable, surprising, creative ways God fulfills his promises and strive to have that mindset while you wait. Anticipate and imitate. So, your life may feel like You've been invaded by the Assyrians. Maybe you feel at times, maybe today's a good day. I hope it is. But we all have our days when we just, there's no optimism to hold on to, but we do have hope. Someone's turned out your lights in some way in your life. It's, it's physical pain. It's, it's your health that doesn't seem to get better, maybe even worse, uh, mental pain. As I mentioned earlier, the devastating scars of family life. Guilt, shame, dysfunctional relationships. This is reality in our world today. And you can say, well, where is God? If we're honest, I mean, the psalmist did it. Where, where are you, God? Is he here? Can he still work in my, will you still work in my life? Will you fulfill promises in my life? And, and, and you think these things, and you're like, man, there's no reason to be optimistic. Things are not getting better for me, only worse. That's when you have to remember hope. Hope stands on its own two feet, no matter the circumstances. It stands alone. And you think about Jesus, remember his prayer in the garden before he was arrested. Jesus didn't want that suffering to happen. It's there, read it. He, he didn't want it to go out that way. He knew it was coming, but he was asking God if, if, if there could be another way. He was, he was suffering. Jesus did not want the crucifixion to happen. I think... What we need to realize, what you need to realize, 
is Jesus meets you in the garden. In the garden, Jesus is just like you. But then God comes in and fulfills his promises to you. And he does it in a very surprising, unexpected way. So you see, the cross is where God meets you in the dark glens of your life. The cross is where Jesus and when Jesus felt the absence of God's presence. I mean, he, he says it just like when we say, God, where are you? What are you doing, God? <clears throat> Jesus, where are you, God? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And that's the irony of it all. It's God that's God forsaken. That's the paradox of the cross. And that's the source of your hope. At the cross, that's where Jesus meets us in our darkness. He's waiting. And we're waiting on God too. We're waiting on God in, in some way, shape, or form to turn the lights back on. And He will. That's a promise. We need that word of hope. Just like the people in Isaiah's time and following, they waited, they, they hoped. For the Messiah and for this Savior to come for the first time, you and I now wait for the second coming of the Messiah. And that's our ultimate hope. And I think God wants nothing more than to surprise us, to surprise all of us with hope. I dare you to hope. 